Well, our reading today is from John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles at home. John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. At dawn, he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the centre Teacher, they said to him, this woman who was caught in the act of committing adultery in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. And when they persisted in questioning him, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the, one to f- should be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the centre. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, sermon outline is there and we're going to work our way through this passage. If you've got any questions, please use the comments box at the bottom of the page. Uh, When we deal with such a controversial topic as Jesus is love or anything with Jesus and love connected together, we have to be very careful that we don't stoop to straw men, uh, to convenient, even false descriptions of what other people think. Keeping that in mind, I reckon if I ask people on the street to explain what Jesus is love or Jesus is loving means, they'd give me one of two answers. Jesus is love, firstly, means that Jesus accepts everyone as they are. Jesus is love, secondly, means that Jesus does not judge a person. In essence, I think if you boil these statements down, if you boil these understandings down, then love is revealed as approval or acceptance or at least a blank check for me to be who I am, who I want to be, to do what I want to do. Now that raises all sorts of questions, doesn't it? It raises all sorts of questions about how you define love, how you live love, as well as how we do with what Jesus reveals in what he says and does in the Bible. So when I say what I love about Jesus is he is loving What does the Bible say? Let me pray and we're going to dive into it. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that John wrote so that we could know the true identity of Jesus, your son, who has come into the world to save the world. Thank you for your great goodness in this. Help us to understand what it means for us to connect Jesus and love and what it means from your perspective. Amen. As we begin... Uh, Let me be very clear about two aspects of what we'll be thinking about today. Uh, First, the concept of love in the Bible is, to put it simply, massive. Uh, It is multifaceted, uh, it is context-driven, it's complex and diverse, all in God's revelation. We are not going to be dealing with every aspect of love, let alone every context of it, let alone even a really simple definition of it. We're not going to be doing that today. Second, and this is a corollary, what we're thinking through today could have been differently discussed depending on the passage. For example, if we had decided to look at John chapter 13, verse 1 and following, the slant would have driven us towards what does love look like expressed within God's community. Now, we're not going to cover every passage. In fact, we're only going to focus on John 8. We're not going to cover every aspect of love, and you breathe a sigh of relief. But it also means that we might not answer all of your questions, assumptions or experiences today as we look at this. So that's a great spur for you and for me to keep reading and studying God's word even more on this topic. Well, Jesus has had a big week. I'm at point two on the outline. If you scan back over the chapter leading up to this episode, Jesus has been in Jerusalem for the festival or the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a feast to celebrate the harvest intake. It was connected with both water and light. It contains some of Jesus' most famous sayings. It's the most popular of the festivals and the population of Jerusalem swelled considerably. 
Jesus went secretly, John chapter 7, verse 10. His reputation preceded him. The crowds were looking for him. They were talking about him and they were making decisions about him, coming to judgments about his identity. Rumors were swirling concerning him and the Jewish authorities were searching for him. The week that followed from when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem was one of revelation. Jesus spoke very clearly about his nature as God's chosen messenger is doing God's chosen work. Jesus spoke very clearly about his mission to offer living water. Jesus spoke very clearly about the opposition to him. Those who opposed him wanted to kill him and were working against the law of Moses. And the week that emerged out of this was one of debate and argument, reaction and judgment about Jesus' identity. The week that followed was one of active attempts to arrest Jesus, to remove him from the national stage and consciousness. At the end of that week, Jesus remained. The rumours remained and the opposition remained. Look there at John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn he went to the temple complex again. All the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. I'm at point three on the outline. It's a contested scene. The scene that we're about to spend time in is contested on a number of levels. It doesn't just portray a contest, it's actually a contested passage. Put simply, the earliest and most reliable manuscripts of John's Gospel don't have this episode in them. Certainly later copies do, but not the earliest and most reliable. To put it bluntly, it has a number of inconsistencies. The Pharisees and scribes never appear together in John. The attempt to trap Jesus seems a little strange after their attempt to arrest him. And a number of scholars have pointed out that its language and mannerisms are very similar to Luke's biography of Jesus. That being said, recognising all of that, as Don Carson points out, quote, there is little reason for doubting that the event here described occurred even if in its written form it did not in the beginning belong to the canonical books. Now the nature of the detail, the way in which Jesus is described as bending down, standing up, speaking, writing and the response of the older men, the way in which the event unfolds speaks to a real event. It tastes like a real event. Well, Jesus begins, I'm at point four on the island, Jesus begins the day where he always spent the day doing what he always did during the day when he was in Jerusalem. He was in the temple. The crowds came to him. He was teaching. It was public, transparent, and open. Verse 3, Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, This woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him. The religious leaders bail him up. They step into the teaching circle. The coalition's unique in John, but it's there in the other Gospels. They come to Jesus with a woman and a question. You heard the question there in verses 4 to 5. Now, if you read it quickly, you might just brush over the top of it. You might not pick up the slightly off smell that surrounds the situation. After all, adultery is wrong. The sentence is prescribed in the Old Testament, but slow down and you realise the discrepancies. If she was caught in adultery, in the act of committing adultery, then where was he? A portion of the law referred to, and at least Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 does say both must die, but it doesn't say it must be by stoning, which was actually far less common than we think. In fact, it all depends on whether the woman was single, married or betrothed. So you see, the key issue actually isn't her sin, is it? The key issue is made clear in verse 6. It's a pretense to trap Jesus. The issue is not the woman's sin and judgment, adultery and the upholding of the law. The issue is their desire to kill Jesus. Uh, And it is a trap. On the one hand, if he says, let the woman go, then he's shown to be not upholding God's law as revealed supposedly in the Old Testament. If he does say to stone her, then his reputation as a kind, gracious, gentle, loving Righteous man is undermined and undercut. Either way, Jesus is caught. And Matthew's account at this point makes clear the guilt 
not just of the woman, that's not under debate, but significantly, it makes clear the guilt of those who brought her before Jesus. They're the experts in the law given by God. The law that was given by God so that God's people could represent God to the world. As experts, these men were shown to be opportunistic, opportunistic hypocrites. A woman condemned, a man said free, pick which one. A woman used as a stalking horse. A woman publicly shamed and regarded as disposable or at least her life for a larger victim. A a man renowned for his perfection and good deeds and righteous living being set up. It's really a fairly shabby scene, isn't it? And Jesus' response is appropriately dismissive of the accusers and their questioning. Don't worry about what Jesus is writing in the dirt. No one knows what he wrote. Take the imagery for what it is. Jesus has no interest in the games of these men or any interest in participating in their grossly unjust sin. Well, they persist in badgering him. That's a contrast in styles, isn't it? The hectoring men and the quiet still Jesus. And we've got to grasp how vivid the eyewitness scene is here as Jesus stands and bends and stands and talks and they pester and the noise rises and eventually Jesus speaks. Verse 7, he stood up and said to them, the one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. Well known. What's not as well known is how sharp a scalpel this is, how many layers it cuts through. On one level, the law that these men were referencing made it clear that the witnesses were to be trustworthy non-participants in the same sin, more than one, and the first to throw the stone, Deuteronomy 13 and 17. On a slightly deeper level, as you follow that through, Jesus' words expose the complicity of these men. They might not have been guilty of adultery at that moment, at this time, but they knew their own minds and hearts, didn't they? And moreover, their actions at that moment, as Matthew describes them, speaks of their own sin of entrapment and lying and hypocrisy and even a desire for murder. On the deepest level, Jesus exposes the nature of their hearts as sinful. The nature of the plan of these men shows that they have desired to take on the role reserved for God alone. They've taken upon themselves the role of judge, jury and executioner. They've taken to themselves the right and role and responsibility of God alone to judge someone eternally. And for the woman, this is played out in their willful use of her as an an object to be disposed of for Jesus, they seek his destruction. Whichever one, they want to be God and they want God's job. In that sense, Jesus' words expose the heart of all sin, don't they? In all humans, to take upon ourselves the role of God and to seek to be God instead of God. And he poses the question to these men, really, who are you to take on the role of God? He bends down to write again. The men seem to be silenced. In fact, their gradual response says the truth of Jesus' exposure. Look there at verse 9. When they heard this, they left one by one, starting with the older men. Only he was left with the woman in the centre. They leave. The older ones show the advantage of age and experience. They leave first. And Jesus is finally left alone with the woman. Look there in verse 10. When Jesus stood up, he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go, and from now on do not sin any more. His first question is quite clear, isn't it? It's obvious, but it gets the issue out in the air. Notice she isn't acquitted at this point. In fact, there's no formal verdict of acquittal at any point. But no one condemns her. His second response is where the rubber hits the road. In two parts, he explains or displays the heart of what has just happened, what he's on about. His first statement is quite clear. He doesn't condemn the woman. In essence, he refuses to join the sinful hearts of those men who brought her in taking on the role of God. That's a remarkable statement when we remember that Jesus himself has the right to forgive sins. Just look at Mark 4. That places him as God, with God. And yet as a human being in this situation, Jesus leaves eternal judgment where it belongs, in the hands of God. But don't hear him wrongly. He's not ignored the woman's sin. He's not swept it under the carpet. He's not rationalised it. His second statement in verse 11, go and from now on do not sin anymore. The, The guilt of the woman, the sin of the woman has not been in question, has it? At no point. Jesus himself now confronts it. And having experienced the mercy of Jesus, having received what she did not deserve, a form of pardon, 
her life must now change. She too must step away from sin and serve God as God, the rightful ruler of her life, to come under God's rule, to have God where he belongs, in charge. In fact, it is a very clear command from the lips of Jesus, go, don't sin. And we're never told if this woman truly repented. We're never told if she truly turned back to God. We're never told if this woman responded appropriately to this mercy, this grace, and that's what it really is, isn't it? Grace, receiving what she does not deserve. I suspect that this is because this short section is not so much about the woman, is it, or the men. It's about Jesus and how he dealt with sin and the contrast with the religious leaders of the day and perhaps us. And so that brings us to the question at hand. Because I wonder whether you've asked it so far in this sermon. Why this passage? Why choose a passage to talk about Jesus is loving? Why choose a passage to talk about Jesus and love when the passage doesn't mention love? Why choose this passage when there are others like it but that have the word love in it, like John 13? Well, I want you to consider again the way Jesus deals with the situation first. Jesus recognised where he stood before God. He understood that God was God and he was human and that impacted on the way Jesus dealt with sin and judgment as a human. Second, Jesus did not ignore the sin in front of him. He didn't sweep it under the carpet, didn't dismiss it, didn't belittle it, didn't rationalise it. He dealt with it appropriately with God as God. Thirdly, sin having been dealt with, confronted, Jesus commanded change. As the woman for the consequences of her sin being dealt with as it should be, she was commanded to change, to repent in her life. And it's an important sequence to recognise because it drives to the very heart of how Jesus expresses love even when the word love is not mentioned. We can say that because of the way love is described as revolving around Jesus in other parts of the Bible, how sin is dealt with in particularly those two passages that we've touched on earlier on today, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, 1 John 4, 7 to 12. In both those passages, sin is recognised for what it is, present in the heart of humanity, a direct challenge to God, his rule, role and authority. In both those passages, sin is not minimised, not dismissed, not rationalised, not avoided. Sin is confronted. It's dealt with. In both those passages, the one who deals with sin is the one all humans commit sin against, uh, God. In both those passages, the way sin is dealt with is through Jesus and Jesus alone, who enters into this world because of God's and Jesus' love for those who rebel against God. In both those passages, Jesus dealing with sin in love actually creates change in people's lives, in the whole flow of humanity. It takes the dead and makes them alive, takes the enemies and makes them God's reconciled people. It's captured very clearly in Ephesians 2, doesn't it? There's a change in the walk of people between verse 2 and verse 10 because their sin is dealt with. In 1 John 4, they change from being lacking in love to being the expression of love. And so Jesus displays that collection of attitudes and actions that show how God deals with the sin of humans in a way that is both surprising and relieving. It's God's role to deal with sin. God deals with sin through Jesus, confronting it as it is and judging it as it should be. This transforms the lives, or it should transform the lives, of of those who've had their sins dealt with by God. And it's driven by love an expression of grace and mercy, the giving of what is not deserved to those who deserve condemnation. What I love about Jesus, I'm at the last point on the outline, what I love about Jesus is that he is loving. He's the expression of love. It doesn't give us a definition of love, and we haven't come up with one today, have we? might be worthwhile thinking about that in the week ahead. It doesn't cover cover every facet of love as it's described in the Bible. But it shows us that love is at least this, the confrontation of our sin under God that completely transforms our lives, giving us what we do not deserve. Let me say that again. It shows us that love is at least this, the confrontation of our sin under God that completely transforms our lives, giving us what we do not deserve. I love this. For three very simple reasons. My sin is dealt with as God designed. 
My sin is dealt with as I don't deserve. My sin is dealt with and I am transformed. Now, our world offers so many different permutations for love. So much misunderstanding about love, about Jesus and love, that in this world that is wonderful news. It deals with our greatest need, our sin. It deals with it rightly and amazingly. And it brings transformation that we desperately need. In this world, this week, wouldn't that love be worth sharing? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can read it. Thank you that it can speak to us of Jesus dealing with sin rightly, which is love. Thank you that it expresses something that we do not deserve, complete and utter transformation, forgiveness, restoration. Father, thank you for this love. Please help us to declare it this week. Amen.